Thank you for watching the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation's Clinical Trials Training Video. This is an edited version of MDF's Clinical Trials 101 webinar, presented by Dr. Bruce Wentworth of Genzyme and Jeannie Dechtebrunn and Elizabeth Luby of the University of Rochester. That webinar can be viewed at www.myotonic.org. I thought we might go over a few slides uh, to discuss just what a clinical trial is like, and, and I would even start I think with some background information on just uh, the kind of time and energy um, and frankly money that it takes uh, to get to a, uh, a clinical trial process. It's really, as, as you can see on the slide now, quite a lengthy process um, which starts with uh, preclinical research, uh, moving uh, on to uh, uh, preclinical development. Um, which is the process where you uh, actually prepare your dossier and do experimental work that goes into the dossier to attest to the probability of safety uh, for, your, for your drug of interest and ultimately on to clinical research. And, and that whole process from preclinical research uh, up and, and through the trials uh, can be uh, over a decade or more. But I want to point out that um, the preceding process to all of that is the discovery process, which is where um, uh, everyday bench scientists, which, which all of us, myself included, have in one form or another been in our, in, in our past lives, uh, do basic discovery research. Um, and it's where the findings generally come from that make the concepts for new drugs possible. So this is really a long process. Uh, for example, the, the work that's being done now using antisense technology, um, that work actually began um, during the time that I was in graduate school, which is in the 1980s. Uh, that was a long time ago, and it's only now that we're seeing the fruition of that work in, in several product, products, one of which is Mipomersin, but now the current uh, form of a product, form of a drug um, for myotonic dystrophy, so it's taken quite a long time. Needless to say, that's very costly. Um, if you start to count in the failures that uh, large companies have, it can be easily over a billion dollars that it, that it costs to bring a drug um, to market. And it's actually quite risky. There's a lot of failure along the way. That's the reason, in part, that it's so expensive. And when failure occurs, it usually occurs um, in phase two of the clinical trial process. So in the end, success is quite rare, um, with only about a third of, of uh, marketed drugs actually producing the revenues for the companies um, that they had imagined. So the, the actual concept of a trial is really quite simple. Um, we talked about preclinical testing. Um, that's done in a variety of systems, animals, um, as well as, as cells and sometimes just basic chemistry. And it's at that stage that you try to understand the mechanism of action of a drug and determine what's likely to be safe doses that you should start with in phase one studies. And in phase one, what you demonstrate there, that's where you first enter human beings, um, you demonstrate safety for many drugs this happens in normal volunteers, uh, and that's because it is plausible for the drug to be consumed um, with, without adverse effect, at least one hopes, uh, by a normal, uh, a normal individual. In the case of rare diseases, um, that sometimes is difficult because the drug itself is highly specific to an individual with the disease state. Um, and it may not be sensible and in some cases not even ethical to give the drug to a normal volunteer. Uh, but nonetheless, at that phase, uh, you demonstrate uh, that your drug is probably safe. So you, you fulfill what you have shown preclinically now, uh, now in human beings. And if you get through that phase successfully, uh, you can move on to phase two. Phase one is short, phase two is longer, and in phase two, you actually explore that dosing process and um, try to begin to gain evidence for efficacy uh, 
all along the way, always following safety. Um, and phase two is really the hypothesis generating phase um, where you establish exactly what, how you think this drug is going to work and how it's going to be modeled in a treatment scenario. And if you don't find evidence for efficacy, uh, that's the reason why a drug fails um, in phase two. Or if with longer treatment, you now have a safety signature that's alarming. So assuming you get through phase two, you have evidence for efficacy, and you are continuing uh, to see uh, reasonable evidence of tolerability of the drug, you can move on to phase three. And phase three is where uh, the, the drug is, first place, you confirm the data you've seen in phase two, and you actually demonstrate how this drug is to be used clinically. And phase three is quite important because the, the data that goes into phase, that, that comes out of phase three um, is often uh, and, uh, reported in the, the packaging insert. And, and it's that package insert and the label of, on the drug that determines exactly who should be getting it, how, how a physician uh, should be prescribing this drug, and, and how it's to be used for, for maximum effect and the maintenance of safety. And at that point, you, you seek approval. And uh, at least in theory, um, uh, you're approved. Uh, and that's what we're hoping for as well uh, with, with the studies that are about to begin, um, uh, for example, with Biogen in myotonic dystrophy. So, so just exactly what's a clinical trial like? Well, you're going to be assigned to a treatment group where you might get the new drug at one or, 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 or another dose, but you also might be part of the placebo group. And there are cases where placebo is not possible, um, and in some cases where placebo might not even be ethical. But in most cases, placebo is a, is a really important uh, part of the drug testing process because Everything we know about a disease is based upon preceding information, usually in the absence of a drug trial. And in many cases, um, it, it is, it is, it's been demonstrated that individuals can actually affect the outcome simply on the basis of how they feel about being in a trial. For some individuals, this is the first time that they that they have perhaps felt in control or that they were positively doing something. And indeed, they are making a wonderful contribution. But that also can change outcome. So it's, it's important that not only uh, we try to have placebo groups where possible, um, but that, that the process is blinded, meaning that the individual taking uh, the drug or the placebo is unaware which they're getting, um, and that they approach this, therefore, um, uh, with a maximum unbiased nature. And in the best circumstance, the individual administering the drug also is unaware as to whether or not they're getting the placebo uh, or, or the drug. Uh, and, and if you can't do that, then the individuals evaluating the patients are unaware um, as to which uh, the patient got. And again, that's to try to make sure that the data is as clean as is possible. So during this process, you're going to be tested for various abilities, both before and after treatment. Um, in the case of, of uh, drugs that we're interested, that's most likely going to be muscle strength or, for example, walking ability, uh, perhaps myotonia. Um, all of these various um, uh, aspects that would help to determine whether or not the drug in question is having a clinically meaningful effect on the life of the patients. Uh, you may also need to give blood for testing or have muscle biopsies taken. And this is because not only do we want to know that there's a functional outcome with the drug, but we really want to know that the drug has engaged its target. It's usually pretty difficult for an individual to um, affect a biochemical test whereas they might be able to affect a physical test. And if the drug is engaging its target, meaning it's doing the thing at, at a chemical level and a biologic level that we, we think it should be doing, 
those kinds of tests tend to be pretty unbiased, and they can tell us whether or not things are working as we expect. Um, you can also be asked in various trials um, to be uh, to help with other testing related to the disease, even if it's not part of the trial outcome. So there can be secondary uh, outcome measures um, or so-called FYI studies that are be, being done, particularly in earlier phases, um, to try to determine whether or not a particular outcome is actually a good thing to be testing or not. And needless to say, you'll be followed quite closely during the study um, and probably depending on the nature of the study, but conceivably for quite some time afterwards as well. So all of this also leads to functional endpoints. Um, it could be, as I'm showing in these images, uh, examples of myotonia measurement. Uh, myotonia, as many of you know, is something that can actually be demonstrated through a handshake, although probably a more quantitative test than that. Uh, would be employed, but it actually can be done as simply as that, as well as various and sundry types of quantitative muscle testing to show whether or not um, the patients are, are regaining strength um, over the course of a trial. And it's those endpoints that are, uh, if they're met, um, that establish whether or not the drug has had its effect. And it's quite important, especially during phase two, that the study is done carefully because you, one is going to need to predict what degree of efficacy is needed, how much better you're going to have to be at a given test in order to establish that the drug actually did something meaningful. And in order for that, um, those estimates to be made, that also uh, is a function of how large the trial is, how many patients you need to get into the study. It would be Needless to say, a shame if one has a study that is too small, meaning it's underpowered, to show the kind of difference you need to show for a given um, endpoint. So, so that's a, a point of very careful consideration in the trial, and that's partly why trials take a long time getting people into them, and it takes sometimes a long time uh, to finish a trial, um, certainly months, and in many cases it is, it is a couple of years. We ask patients not to share their results um, if they're participating in a clinical trial. Um, and the reason for that is we, um, we, we're not sure what patients may be taking if it's a blinded trial and patients are, you know, blinded as well. Um, so they may be reporting on symptoms even if they're taking a placebo and um, sharing their information could um, it could sway the results of the study um, and, and lead to um, other patients reporting symptoms that they might not actually be experiencing. And as you know, um, a lot of these, these studies are very important and we wouldn't want anything to kind of um, disrupt this study from being successful.